was here last night. Yes, sir. I know exactly how it feels. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for coming out tonight. My name is Keith Perry, one of the co-founders of Food with a Collection. Um, as I said, we talked uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, actually about three weeks mm -hmm. now, and she told me about this Life Remix series, and I started sharing with her some of the things that I've been through in my life and what changed my life and how did I get to the place, you know, that propelled me to get to FUBU because it was a lot of things before that that people really don't realize and the places I came from and things I overcame. So I just like to delve into that for a little while and just tell you guys, you know, I was born and raised in Queens, New York um, to a teenage mother and father, same age, 18 years old. Um, but, you know, I went through a lot of the things that some of these kids who, my, one of my missions actually before I get started is to help underage kids, to help underprivileged kids, you know, see the light. Because a lot of them don't have any hope, they don't have any aspirations, they see what they see on their block and they think that that's it. And when it's really not, you know, you have to travel outside to actually see other things that's going on, maybe in your community or maybe in somebody else's community. But one of the things that, that you know, when I sit down and I talk to them about is I came from the same place they came from. You know, I came, I grew up on welfare. You know, I grew up not having heat, not having hot water, not having lights, you know, roaches in the kitchen, you know. <laughs> afraid, to go to the, afraid to go to the store with the food stands. You know, that was the paper toy. You know? <laughs> so, you know, I, I went through all of that and I experienced all of that. And, and, you know, just growing up in my neighborhood, it was a few, a few things that I, that I saw out there that kind of gave me my direction in life. You know, we had, as I was explaining to someone earlier, we had the Supreme Team, which was the big drug dealers around there, and they, you know, driving all the, the, the fancy cars, and I had all the women and the money and all of that. Then you had the entrepreneurs who were like LL Cool J, Russell Simmons, Run DMC, Salt and Pepper, coming through the neighborhood. So you would actually see these people riding through the neighborhood and looking at their cars, I'm like, oh, man, I want one of those cars. I want to be like them. You know, so you had a choice. And then you had the working class family who was out there, and they were doing their thing, growing up and building their families. So you had, you had three options. Um, a lot of us chose the wrong option. You know, I chose the wrong option for a little while, but I kind of got back on track. And, you know, that, that whole era where the crack era came in was, was a killer because it affected me personally, my family, my you know, a lot of people that was around me, a lot of my friends, you know, I saw them just wither away to nothing, you know, and that's not what I wanted to do and that's not who I wanted to be. So I moved away from the neighborhood at 17 years old and wound up coming back for New Year's, right? So when I get back from New Year's, we're hanging out, everybody's drinking and, you know, going out. So me and my friends said, you know what, let me go to my house for a second. I got something at my house, I want you to come, you know, coming into my house. So I went over there. His mother's walking around with a half a gallon of uh, spurring on vodka under her arm mm. and, you know, a cup. I'm thinking it's mm. like water or something, but it's a cup full of vodka. So she's like, toast with me, toast with me. So I said, I toast. Everybody's <laughs> drinking and, they, and she, his mother goes, boom. <laughs> and he goes, boom. And I'm like, oh, shit. And I throw it up and I'm like, oh! <laughs> like, what is this? Like, you know, I never drunk straight liquor before. So I, I had drunk that and about an hour later, I was completely wasted. So we wound up going outside and we see a stolen car. So that's what I was into back then. I was stealing cars and riding around in stolen cars all the time. So we saw a stolen car. So I got in the car. I stole it from the person who stole it, <laughs> and, I drove, and I drove around the neighborhood like, okay, it's New Year's, we got a car, we have money in our pocket, everybody's good, we dress nice, and what happened was, I went to the store, came back, and I used to drive cars erratically, just turning corners and two wheels and just doing all these stupid things when I was a teenager. So that night, I wound up crashing. I crashed the car and I bust my face open. I don't know if you guys can see my scar. But I bust my face open at 17 years old. And I didn't go to the hospital that night. I went to my friend's house, who I was with. His sister cleaned me up, took all the glass out of my face. And you know, I sat there, I said, you know what? My mother used to always preach, don't go to jail, don't let them put a number on you. I'm telling you, if you get a number put on you, your life is ruined. So I was petrified of going to jail. So I said, listen, I'm not gonna go to the hospital tonight. 
I might go tomorrow because they might be looking for me tonight. So what happened was, I wound up going to sleep. I woke, I woke up about 6.30 in the morning. The guys saw me woke up and they was like, oh, who got you woke up now going to sleep? So now they go to sleep and I get up and as soon as I sit up, blood is dripping down my face. And I'm like, I'm still bleeding? So I'm like, what the hell is going on? So I, you know, I get up, I go home. So I go home and I, you know, my mother, like I said, she, she was very militant growing up. So she's like one of those street person, 5% of her you know, whatever you want to call it, but she was into that. So I get home and I tell her, I said, listen, Ma, some guy hit me with a bow on my head trying to steal my coat. <laughs> so she gets up to me and looks at me. She's like, bullshit. <laughs> I ran upstairs to the bathroom to get dressed. So now I'm standing there like, okay, that didn't work. <laughs> what the hell am I going to tell her next? So, you know, me and my mom's had a real cool relationship with anybody, you know, my wife knows, she sees me around my mother, but we have like almost a sister-brother relationship. So, I go in there, she's in the bathroom sitting on the toilet, I knock on the door, <laughs> I go in the bathroom with her and I said, she said, now tell me what's going on, tell me the truth. So I said, Ma, um, I was in the, uh, she said, what, spit it out. I said, I was just in the stolen car. She was like, okay, okay, listen. Cops and the ambulance is on their way. You can't speak. All, you, all I want to hear you say, ooh, that's all you want. <laughs> I'm all the talking. So now I get downstairs and the cops are downstairs, the ambulance, and I'm nervous. I'm like, oh, I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to go to jail. So I get outside and she's holding me. She's like, just lean on me. And she's walking me. <laughs> so we get to the ambulance. The cop is like, what happened? And I said, somebody tried to rob him. Now come on, get up in here. So she pushed me in the ambulance, and I go to the to the hospital, and you know, while the doctor's working on me, taking my blood and everything. So the doctor says, well, when did this happen? I said, it all happened a few hours ago. He said, no, this had to happen about six or more hours ago because your skin is dried up, and it's not this it's not fresh. Mm -hmm. So. After he did a bunch of tests on me, he came back in the room, he said, you know, can I talk to you for a minute? He closed the door, he said, if you wouldn't have came here in the next hour, you would have died wherever you was at. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, I'm 17, you know, gung-ho, real wild, and I'm like, die? Die? Are you serious? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I just saw everything just flash back. I saw the people I used to hang out with, you know, the good things, the bad things. And then I said to myself, you know what? I got these guys over here who are, you know, selling drugs, robbing people, stealing, doing all kinds of things, hanging on the corner. Then I got my pool guys who I go out of town with and I travel and I do things with and it's fun, it's exciting, it's something different, it's not on the block. So I just kind of weighed my options and I said, you know what, I'm going to leave these guys alone. I'm going to take these two guys that I really like, I'm going to take them out of here and I'm going to... Now go mess with my, my fool guys. So that's how I kind of, you know, we all went to school together, but that's how I kind of drifted into to, to these guys and being with these guys. And from there, we just started to, to, to really bond. It was like brothers, we were like, it was like four, bro three brothers I didn't have, I never had. And we started to build this thing that you guys know today in school. And there was a lot of starting and stopping. But I don't think people know, because we started like late 89, 90, you know, made a couple of hats and then stopped. And then in 92, we made a couple more hats and then we stopped because we didn't have the money. And Jay Alexander, who's, you know, one of my partners, he came home from the service, I think it was like 92, he came home and he had, get got into an accident. So he had a couple dollars, I think it was like $5,000. And he said, like, listen, you guys want to do this, I'll, I'll help fund it. So he put the money in and he funded it. And we started to build up from there. And by the time, I, I say 94 came, we were broke again. Now, at, at 94, we were like, okay, is this thing going to work? You know, because everybody still had their jobs and they was working and, and going to school or whatever they were doing. But we was like, is this thing going to work? Can it work? So Damon gave us this book that's called um, Thinking Grow Rich. So he said, listen, I want you guys to read this book. Read this book. I mean, just read a couple times and, and, and then let's talk about it. So we all read the book and got a great understanding of the book and how to push ourselves and motivate ourselves. So we said, he said, listen, I'm going to mortgage this house, I'm going to take $100,000 and put it back into the company. So now I'm like, well, we got $100,000, we're about to take off. And we went, did that, read the book, took the money, put it back in the business. Six months later, we was broke. <laughs> <laughs>
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So now we're like, what the hell do we do now? So then we're like, listen, I'm just going to stop this for a little while, then we get back into it. Let's, let's put our, get our heads right and, put, and get back into this at a later time. So we stopped again, and then around 95, his mom's just like, listen, you guys need to put an ad in the paper for an investor. You know, you, you're going down to Magic, you got papers, you, you came back with $300,000 worth of orders, won't you put in the ad? So we wound up putting in the ad saying that, you know, we had $300,000 in order, we need an investor. When I tell you all kind of people, like Donnie Brasco is calling us like, hello, what do you need, $3 million, $10 million? <laughs> you know, we're guys from the, the street. You know, who's going to call you over the phone and offer you $10 million? Like, that just didn't make sense. So we were very, you know, standoffish with a lot of the calls. And then one call came through was from Samsung America. And they called us and said, listen, we want to set up a meeting with you guys. We went up there, set up the meeting. Everything was great. We thought we were going to come back, and we was going to be on our way. They never called us back. Mm. So we're sitting around. We're like, okay, we got to keep going. Now, at this point, we had every, I mean, not every, but we had Buster, Nas, Rampage. I mean, numerous artists coming to the house to pick up clothes to go on tour. So we were doing okay, so we said, you know what, maybe we need to hook up with Hype because he's doing videos and he's putting out videos just to be a way to market ourselves. Now, mind you, we knew nothing about marketing, nothing about branding, nothing about advertising, or anything. We just knew if we get it out there, somebody would buy it. So we wound up putting it together and then after, the, after we got, you know, to that point where Samsung came, actually came back to us because they saw a, a video of us Fred Joe Star came in the house one day and said, listen, I'm doing this TV show, and you know, I need some shirts, you know, I'm about to do this ill scene, you know, give me something fly. So we gave him a shirt, and he got killed in his shirt. And when I tell you it took him 20 minutes to fall in his shirt, <laughs> you know, he just was, <laughs> he was doing this, and it was like slow motion, and all you saw on the TV was fubu. All, I mean, just in, the, in your face, and just fubu, fubu, fubu. So, we're at home, we jump into it like, give me your TV, give me your TV, <laughs> going crazy. But we never thought that that show would catapult us to where we, you know, where we needed to be. And I think a few days later, the, one of the guys who, who we had a meeting with was watching the TV show, and he called us and said, listen, are you guys still, you still around? I see you still doing your thing. Why don't you guys come on back down for another meeting? So that's how we wound up going back down and getting, into, getting you know, funded by Samsung America, which was their first textile division brand, actually, that they actually put out. So, 20 years later, <laughs> you guys know the story about how we came up and what we did with the LL Cool J, and, 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 you know, even, you know, I'm going to tell you a story, I want to get back into the story with LL for a minute. You know, LL was funny because when he came, when we was trying to get him to put it on, he kind of gave us the insight to actually get him because we were like, like let's just get an artist and put on an artist and you know you guys would be straight and people start buying it so we like okay what about you <laughs> he's like man I got Nike I got Timberland after me and we were like oh we can't compete with that so we took him to the side he's like listen man we we'll, we'll do anything as soon as we start making money we'll give you you know whatever you need us to do we'll take care of you you know we'll make you a partner in the business you know just help us get off the ground. So he looked at us and he just saw the drive and he was like, you know what, I'm going to help you guys out. Give me that shirt. He put the shirt on. He was actually going out of town and all he did was stood up in his limo, stood outside his limo with the shirt on. Boom. That was it. He nice our first ad. Our first ad with LL and then it just took off from there. We kept our word. We made him a partner in the business. He's still a partner in the business. And, and you know, that's, I, I don't want to go through the whole fool story. I know some, most of you guys know the fool story. Or yeah. Yeah. So, you know, we, we did our thing, but, it, you know, the, the greatest, there's a lot of great moments that I'm really proud of food because we were a lot of, we were the first to do a lot of things. We were the first to get an Essence Award for a company. Everybody that prior to us that got an Essence Award was a person. Um, wow. We would, uh, you know, we wound up meeting Nelson Mandela. He invited us to his house in South Africa, which was a phenomenal, phenomenal story. He called us, he, we actually, my licensee, we went out there to open up a store in, in Johannesburg, and 
when we get out there, you know, I'm just like, is this Africa? I'm like, oh, this is the ground. I'm just, you, know, you know, and I'm all, you know, nervous and jittery. I'm like, this is crazy, but it didn't look like, it didn't look like the Africa they portrayed on TV. Mm, right. You know, when you see Africa here, it's a bunch of people running around in the woods with no clothes on, and, you know, and when I got out there, everybody got Gucci bags and Gucci shoes. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. You show me this <laughs> right, 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 right. You know, but it was a part that you never seen. They don't really <laughs> show that side. So we went out there, and then on our way to an event, you know, we sit in a limo or whatever, and the guy called. He said, listen, I got the pool guys out here. They want to, you know, I want to bring them out to meet you. And I heard the conversation, but I didn't know who he was talking to. So he gets off the phone. He's like, okay, cool, I'll bring them by. Hangs up the phone. He goes, listen, Nelson Mandela wants to meet you guys. Nelson <laughs> Mandela? He, he know about food? He's like, yeah, his grandkids, I said, all his grandkids, he knew and everybody, you know, we have a good relationship with him. So I'm like, oh, man, this is crazy. Now, you're talking about kids who were on the block, who everybody in the neighborhood said, you guys ain't going to have no clothing company. Are you serious? Right. Like, and we just kept saying, you know what? We're going to do it. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. So actually, to be in that position, to meet Nelson Mandela, when everybody said you couldn't do it, mm. or something just... Extraordinary, and on our way to go meet him, the phone rings. Hey, I'm have to cancel that. You know what I mean? I gotta run out and meet a dignitary. I'm like, oh, you mean we're this close to me? No, no, you kidding me? So what happened after that? We just said, you know what? Well, we got a trip planned to Sun City. Let's go to Sun City and just, you know, do whatever we need to do out there. So we went out there, and on our way, actually on our second day there, we get another phone call. Is the guy still here? He's back. He wants to meet you. I'm like, well, cut this short. <laughs> let's go right now. Let's go to the car. Let's go back to, to Johannesburg. And we wound up going back there. And I swear, yeah, I've never shook so much in my life. I've mm -hmm. met pretty, pretty much everybody that's out there. You know, celebrities, presidents, first ladies. You know, and I never, even Janet Jackson. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was my love. I was going to penny in the office. I was somewhat nervous when I met her, but I was totally shaking when I met Nelson Mandela, and I couldn't stop shaking. And I'm trying to be cool, and I'm just gonna stand over here, and I'm like. And he came downstairs, and they like, don't take, don't take no pictures of the house. I'm take my flash on. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to get some evidence. Right, right, right. In case somehow, some way, the mother pictures didn't come out. But anyway, he came downstairs, and we stood out there for a minute. We talked to him. He brought us outside. We took pictures with him, and it just, it was, it was a, a, a beautiful day. Like that was the epitome of my time at Food, which is meeting Nelson Mandela. Like I said, I met a lot of people, which is great, but meeting Nelson Mandela and my mom being militant and always preaching about Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King and all that, you know, I didn't have a chance to meet them, but to meet him was that next big thing. So that within itself was, was beautiful. And, um, you know, we, we've done a lot of things and been a lot of places. And, you know, like I said, we, were a lot of, we did a lot of firsts. I ain't really want to go into the food story, but Kango over there, he, That's right. uh, <laughs> he, he, he wants to mess with me tonight. Well, right. As you were. Well, he was in Catholic school. No, 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 let's hear his story first. You know, it, it, it's a great story. thing. You know, even with nowadays, you know, everybody's kind of doing their own thing. You know, we've grown the company. We still own the company. Um, put some bunch of stuff in Walmart, you know. Because a, a lot of, you know, what, what us was, was, was always about giving back. You know, we did a lot of things community-wise, whether it was build-up, you know, we did the, the basketball course on 135th and 5th, you know, put on random basketball course with the New York Knicks. But just giving back for us was, was so big, was we never thought we would be in this position to ever even give back. So our mission became giving back. And, you know, nowadays, you got Damon, he's on Shark Tank, you know, Jay's shooting a pilot right now for a new a reality show. Um, I'm actually, my my, my one of my other partners, Carl Brown, he actually owns a liquor distribution warehouse in New Jersey, which I'm helping him build up right now. Me and him kind of work <coughs> on that every day to help him get it up. Um, and I'm also doing a lot of consulting, um, whether it's small companies, just to try to get, just, you know, that, that, that reach back and lend a hand. I, I really, that to me is like one of my models too, because you have so many people who need, who just need a hand or need, information or guidance or whatever it is, advice, 
And you go to some people and try to get that from them, they don't have two minutes for you. So I always try to reach back to whoever, that, whoever knows me or knows of me. They always know I got five minutes to talk to you and try to uplift you or whatever I can do for you at that time. But um, right now I'm also consulting um, this new basketball league that's coming out. Shame is still. It's called the USBCC. It's um, and the website is www.usbcc.net. It's a it's a, a second. It's almost like a second chance. We call it the second chance league because. It's almost going to be the American Idol. We're building it as like the American Idol of basketball. Um, there'll be ten players. We have we starting off with twenty six teams. We have fifty six teams in total, including Canada, Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. And it's one other one I keep forgetting. I don't know why I keep forgetting that one. But, um, but right now we're putting everything together, and uh, it, it's going to be beautiful. And, and the winning prize is a million dollars. Wow, well, that's great. I, could, I, could so, I want to play. I know, I can play I'm almost six feet tall. Do I qualify? I'm five seven. I'm five seven. I'm four eleven, but I'm trying. Ten players on each team. <laughs> ten, ten players on each team, um, and it's five five people representing a, a college, whatever college it is that you went to in New York or whatever. Then you got five street ball legend guys, whoever's the hottest in New York. Mm -hmm. So they'll be able to try out and, and participate. And we're also branching it off into women's soccer and then women's volleyball as well. Mm -hmm. So we're going to make this big, you know, instead of watching um, Housewives, we'll be able to do this. And, and it happens, it's, it's, it's going to be a summer league thing where so it's going to run from Father's Day to Labor's Day. But we're going to syndicate it and it'll be running all year once we get started. So that's some of the things that I'm working on, and um, you know, if you guys have any questions, I, I do. Know. I want to moderate a Q and A. I, I have a. We're gonna come up into the light. Come to the light. I.